all things are possible. What I pray is it, it's possible for us to hear the voice of God and lay aside all of the tradition that we have built up that dulls our sense of hearing the voice of God. Jesus said to the Pharisees, how nicely you set aside the commandments of God to hold fast to your tradition. We just finished singing, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. Isn't that a beautiful song? We need to return to that place, that heart of worship. The church, all too often and in all too many ways, has returned to Egypt. The celebration that I want to talk about this evening is a celebration of Passover. It's a celebration of God sending deliverance. Deliverance from bondage to freedom. From darkness to light. From death to life. He took the people of God out of bondage in Egypt so that they could go and worship Him. That was the purpose. The purpose is us worshiping God. But for so long, for so long, we have in so many ways gone back daily into Egypt and put ourselves back in bondage with the world and the things of the world. And that's why it was on my heart when Joseph mentioned, I don't even know how this conversation started. Somebody was praying that God would use Easter. Oh, somebody was praying that God would use Easter. And I said, I want to pray that God will bring our hearts back to Passover. Amen. Now, as I start this, all things are possible with God. So one of the things that is possible it's possible for me to stand here and talk about where we have gone astray and how God is calling us back and saying that the church is not doing what God wants it to do. It's possible for me to say that. It's possible for me to say things that tonight that you're going to find difficult. And yet, it's possible that you can sit there and listen, led by the Spirit of God, to what God may speak through me and not take any offense. That is possible. You see, I know that through His Word. Because His Word says in Psalm 119, verse 165, it says, those who love thy law. Now, anybody in here love God's law? Yes. And I want to tell you, I do. It says, those who love thy law shall have great peace, and nothing shall offend them. That's what it says. So I'm going to share what the Lord's been putting on my heart. And I sat down tonight and I made myself a bunch of notes. I'm not even sure I have any kind of order, but God's a God of good order, so I'm trusting in Him. Okay. Amen. I, if you can take notes, take notes. Because this is, a, this is not a sermon. <coughs> this is me sharing what God has put on my heart for us to consider, to meditate upon, to take before Him. Because as I've said here before, faith doesn't come by hearing me preach. Faith doesn't care, but come by hearing me talk. Faith doesn't come by hearing me preach, teach, or anything else. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You've got to hear the voice of God before anything's going to change in your life. Amen. So you need to take what I say here tonight and you need to ponder on it. You need to consider it. You need to meditate on it. Most importantly, you need to talk about what happens here tonight with the Lord. Because I don't want you to trust what I say. I want you to test what I said. But test it against the Word of God. Don't test it by what the church has been doing for the last thousand years, two thousand years. Don't test it by what your pastor, preacher, or favorite guy has been saying on the radio. I want you to test it not by the way you feel. I want you to test it by what God has spoken. Amen. Because that's the only thing sure in the world. Amen. Amen. So I want to talk tonight about Passover. This is the Passover season. Now, very few Christians would ever say that. Because Christians say this is the Easter season. I didn't come here tonight to attack Easter. I came here tonight to rejoice and celebrate 
that thing that God did in my life mm. because He took me out of bondage mm. and delivered me through an impassable, impossible barrier. Hello. That was me. I was the, the barrier. My, my thoughts, my flesh, all the things I had built in my life, that was the barrier that stood before me and the place that God wanted to take me. But the Lord dealt with that. And I celebrate it. I don't celebrate it once a year. I celebrate it daily. Hallelujah. <coughs> That's one of the things we need to learn about the difference from what God wants and from what we are doing. We set aside days. You want to know something? If you do that, that's between you and the Lord. Mm -hmm. That's what Paul said in Romans 14. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what Romans 14 says, write it down, go check it out later. All right. Is Passover a law? God commanded the people. You should, you should celebrate Passover. Is that a law? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a command. Mm -hmm. I think here's one of the problems we have with the law. We've been teaching for a long time that we are under grace. Hallelujah, that's the truth. We're not under the law. But it's not the law that's bad. I mean, this is Paul said this, Jesus said this. May, is the law evil? May it never be. No. The law is a blessing. We've been doing things wrong. Our understanding of the law is what the problem is. I want to read this from Romans 3. This is verses 29 to 31. It says, Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is He not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. Do we nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. That's after the crucifixion. That's after the resurrection. That's after the day of Pentecost. That is New Testament theology. We establish the law when we celebrate the Word of God. Amen. This is not about a burden. It, we, 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 we have come to understand the law is a burden. And I say, you know, I'm going to tell you, I was a Catholic. I was raised a Catholic. I got saved. And at the moment I got saved, I didn't know what I was anymore. People would come and ask me, because, you know what? You ever hear that song, What a Difference He's Made in My Life? The day that I accepted Jesus Christ, He made a difference in my life. And the difference He made in my life was visible to everybody that knew me. He not only gave me new life, He gave me a new lifestyle. He changed my life. Everything about me changed. So people would come up to me and say, What happened to you? What are you? Are you, are you one of those born-again people? Are you charismatic? Are you a this or are you a that? My friends ask me that. My family asks me that. The people that work for me ask me that. My clients ask me that. What are you? And you want to know something? I had no clue what I was. I didn't know. All I knew that was all of a sudden, yesterday I didn't know Jesus, today I knew Him, and He was the Lord of my life. So I went and I prayed. And this, I, I told Alice, I need to go pray. I need to be able to answer that question. Am I, am I now am I still a Catholic? Am I a Pentecostal? Am I a born again Christian? Am I, a, you know, am I a Catholic charismatic? Am I this or that? And I went, and the Lord answered me. He answered me through the words of Paul the Apostle in the eighth chapter of the Book of Romans. He said, "You're my child." You see, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Amen. And you want to know something? That's the only thing He's going to bear witness to. He will not bear witness to the fact that you're a Baptist or an Adventist or a this or a that or that. He will bear witness to the fact that you are a child of God because that's what He did in your life. Hallelujah. And I celebrate that because that was a Passover in my life. I passed from death into life. Amen. So now, I'm trying to understand the law. I understand that I don't get salvation through the law. You can't get salvation through the law. That's what the Word of God says. It's the free gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But the law was put there to be a blessing, not a curse. I started to say I was a Catholic because, you know, now I'm free from the law. I, I don't have to worry about this old Jewish law. You ever hear a canon law? 
If you're an Episcopalian, Church of England, Catholic, you should have heard of canon law. That's the laws that they have now have. They have more of them than you'll ever find in Leviticus. Because religion always tries to put you in bondage. That's the truth. Religion always tries to put you under their regulations. The Sabbath. Is the Sabbath a law? You know, God gave Moses Ten Commandments on that mountain. So now, they don't count anymore? Do they still count? Are, are we free to worship other gods? No. Are we free to have other gods before Him? Are we free to, to take His name in vain? Are we, are we free to not honor your mother and father? Are you free not to keep the Sabbath? No. So what's the deal here? He set us free from the bondage of the law by giving us a right understanding of the law. Mm. Jesus said to the, to the Pharisees, because the Pharisees condemned him, because he didn't live up to their understanding of the law of the Sabbath, the commandment of the Sabbath. So Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. God didn't put a day of rest to burn you. He gave you a day of rest to refresh you. Mm. That's the truth. But all of a sudden, you know, the, that, that day of... We don't even know what the Sabbath day is anymore. We don't. What's the Sabbath day? Come on, this is, this is a participation deal. Somebody tell me what the Sabbath day is. Sunday. You say Sunday. Friday to Saturday. Friday to Saturday. Well, come on, come on, you're doing good. It's your own day of rest after the six days. Those are all... You know what? I, can't, I couldn't argue with any of those. Yeah. However, <laughs> however, I want to just read you something. I'm going to read this. This is from Isaiah 58. And I want you to hear this. It's Isaiah 58, starting at verse 13. Now, and by, by the way, this is Old Testament. This is the prophet Isaiah, right? Mm -hmm. And here's what God speaks through Isaiah. If, because of the Sabbath, you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure, okay. you, you with me so far? Mm -hmm. Did Jesus say in the New Testament, if any man would follow me, he must deny himself? Yeah. It's not about our pleasure, it's about pleasing God. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So every... So on how many days a week, which day of the week are you supposed to not seek your own pleasure, but seek to please God? Which day is that? Okay, every day. I like that. <laughs> and you call the Sabbath the, the, the light, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and honor it desisting from your own ways. Which, which day of the week are you supposed to not do your own ways, but do the way that He leads you, because He leads you in paths of righteousness for Him? Every day. Which day is that? From seeking your own pleasure and speaking your own word. Which day of the week are you not supposed to speak your own word? Now remember that Peter said, New Testament, if any man speaks, let him speak as it were the utterances of God. Jesus Christ himself gave us that example, and this is about imitating Jesus Christ. He said he spoke nothing that he didn't hear from the Father. Which day of the week are you not supposed to speak your own words? <laughs> Uh-oh, I'm, I'm, uh -oh. I'm, I'm beginning to see a pattern here. Mm. Then you will take delight in the Lord. You want to know what day the Sabbath is? This is the day that the Lord has made. I hey. Hey. Today Hallelujah. is the Sabbath of my life. Today is the day that I will rest in the Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Today is the day that I will rest in the Lord. I don't have to wait until the end of the week to rest in the Lord. Mm. I'm not like the world. That's what they do in Egypt. Mm -hmm. They take a day mm. and stop from resting. It says in Isaiah also, Isaiah 30 says, In rest and returning is your strength. You want strength? You want to, we need strength in our life. Amen. There's too many weak people. Uh, you know what day you'll find strength? The day you take delight in the Lord and honor His Sabbath. Hallelujah. By not doing your own pleasure, not, not doing your own thing, by not speaking your own words. Mm. We don't understand the law. We're worried about, oh, is it Saturday, is it Sunday, is it this or that? It's not, we're making it a burden in our lives. Mm. You wonder what we've done? We've gone back to Egypt. 
You see, and it was for freedom, it says, that He set us free. We have been set free from the bondage of the law. That doesn't make the law bad. It makes our understanding bad. Okay. That's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about the Sabbath. No. I mean, the Passover. Okay. Let's just talk about Passover just for a second. Right? You, you know the story. The Hebrews, the people of God. The, are we in agreement that the people of God, that was the Hebrews? The Hebrews are the people of God? Okay. The people of God were in bondage in Egypt. That's the world. God said, Exodus 3, verse 12, He said, Certainly I will be with you, talking to Moses, right? And this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship, worship God at this mountain. I just want to say this again. I said it a minute ago. God set you free. He set you free to worship Him. It is about Him. It is not about you. We have become self-centered. It is a sign of the times. I believe with all of my heart that we are living in the last days. I can, and I talk, I say that to people and they say, Oh yeah, look what's going on in Iran. Look what's going on in Iraq. Look what's going on in Egypt. Look what's going on in Libya. Look what's going on with the economy around the world. Look what's going on with the volcanoes, the earthquakes, the famines. Look at that. You can tell. No, I look into the church. Mm. And I see that we're living in the last days. Mm. Paul wrote to Timothy, his son in the faith, and said to him, 2 Timothy chapter 3, he said, In the last days, perilous times will come. Mm. Perilous times will come. For men, he's talking about the church. church. Go examine it. Go speak to the Lord. He said, In the last days, men will become lovers of self. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Mm. Lovers of money. This is what I see in the church. Mm. You know why? Because he said, in rest and returning is your strength, we've returned to Egypt, not returned to him. The church has gone back into the world. I'm going to say this, and remember what I say. Psalm 119, verse 165. Don't lose sight of that. I don't know what it's like here in the United Kingdom. Well, I have a pretty good idea. But in the United States of America, every single day, tens of thousands of Christian parents take their little children, their precious little children, their adorable little children, the children that they love with all of their hearts, and they put them on buses, school buses we call them. And the school buses, with their bright yellow buses, they carry those children right straight back to Egypt to be trained in the world and the ways of the world. Jeremiah 10 says, do not learn the ways of the nations. We're sending our children back, back into bondage to learn the things that they're told that they need for life. Is that not true? Is that why you send your kids to school? Mm. They're going to be equipped. They're going to be trained to learn the things that they need in life. Minus Jesus Christ. Because He's not allowed. Wow. He stopped at the door. Wow. And I'm going to, well, I'm going to tell you what's worse. Wow. Now tell me I'm not telling you the truth. In the United States of America, you can talk about Jesus in the schools. Somebody say, no, don't say hallelujah. Because you can talk about Jesus in the schools when you're cursing. Because you see, you have freedom of speech, and the government will fight for your freedom of speech. If you're cursing using the name of Jesus Christ, welcome, have at it. But use that name, that only name given by which men can be saved, that name above all names. Use that, honor that name, and use it the way God intended. And they'll tell you, stop, you're not allowed to do that. And we're sending our children in there? Even if they got the best education in the world that was possible. Even if they were the best mathematicians, the best scientists, the best writers, speakers, best everything from that school, you know what they would have learned? They would have learned that Jesus Christ is irrelevant. Hmm. Because they've been told, we're giving you everything that you need for life, but it doesn't include Jesus. But this thing, this Word of God, this eternal Word of God, eternal Word of God, says to me that He has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Hallelujah. We're sending our kids back to Egypt. We celebrate Passover. Here, tonight. We're starting. It's not about Easter eggs, bunnies, rabbits. It's not about that. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Oh, somebody, remember, <laughs> Psalm 119, verse 165. You're not going to get offended. 
Oh, keto. Moses is a type or a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. Does, does everybody understand that? Amen, yes. Because he was a deliverer chosen by God mm -hmm. to go in and set the people free. So, when, when the Lord spoke to him on that mountain and said, Therefore come now and I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. That's a foreshadowing of Jesus mm -hmm. who was sent into the world. Philippians chapter 2, right? Now the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. That's what it says. <laughs> Until, in the fullness of time, in a little place called Bethlehem, Jesus Christ, the Word of God, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And that was the most humble man. Moses himself prophesied of Jesus when he said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen, and you shall listen to him. The Lord sent Moses to set his people free. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters. For I am aware of their sufferings, so I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. And now listen to this. And now, behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, come out now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. First of all, I want you to know, God knows what's going on in your life. Mm. And there are too many Christians. You know, I know when, when you're being obedient to God, when you're walking in the Spirit of God, when you're walking in the world, God can make even your enemies to be at peace with you. Yes. But the fact of the matter is, don't ever get the idea that the world is your friend. Mm. Yeah. And don't try and make friends with the world. Mm. We are called to love them. Mm. We are called to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We are called to proclaim the excellencies of Him who called us out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. You know what Passover is? It is a passage. That's the passage that we've taken, and we're supposed to proclaim that. The world hates you. Jesus Christ said, don't be surprised that the world hates you. It hated me first. See? Am I telling you the truth? So don't be surprised. I run across Christians constantly who were surprised that the world hates him because they are Christians and the world knows it. Now, if you can hide that, and many people do, many Christians do, if you can hide your relationship with Jesus Christ from the world, maybe they won't bother you too much. Mm. Of course, you'll have to face Jesus Christ and explain it. <laughs> and he may bother you. Oh, Lord. But it's a choice that you have to make. It's a passage from death to life that we're supposed to celebrate. God sent Moses into the land to set the people free. And you know how he did that? He did it by his mighty hand. He did it by bringing plagues on the earth in Egypt. Right? So, this culminated in the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn. We're talking tragedy here. None of those plagues were fun. I mean, I, I think we treat them lightly when we even understand what they were. I mean, we're talking about the mighty hand of God bringing disaster and calamity upon the land so that he might work something in his people. Now, Christians tell me, well, that can't happen today. Where did you get that silly idea? God is still in control. Listen to me, I'm going to say this. Psalm 119, verse 165. <laughs> I'm going to say this, you deal with it. A tsunami happens, and I know it causes the death of thousands. An earthquake happens. A hurricane happens and wipes out a city. <coughs> and everybody stands there and says, Ah, oh, it was Mother Nature. It was Father God, because He and He alone is in control. And he is still more concerned with your spirit than with your flesh. And he will reach out and do whatever it takes to set your spirit free. And bring life to your spirit. To take your spirit out of that place where it is dead. And you can go out there tonight in the town center. And you can see the walking dead. Dead walking in their transgressions. Mm. 
And God's desire is to take them in a passage, a passage into life. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what it takes to do that. It took incredible plagues to do that in Egypt. He is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. God is not a man that he should change. Deal with it. But that last plague was horror. The death of the firstborn. The death born from the Pharaoh to the lowliest person in Egypt. The animals. The death of the firstborn. This was the hand of God Almighty. Whose only desire is to bring life. But he'll do whatever it takes to get you where you need to be. Where you can worship him. So what did it take to do that? Here are the three things that it took to do that first Passover. The sacrifice of an unblemished lamb. The consuming of that lamb with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. The people had to consume, to eat that flesh of that lamb. The placing of the lamb's blood on the lintel, on the doorposts and lintels of their houses. That's what it took. One of the, one of the, you know, every, we look at the word Passover in Hebrew. And it's a little, there's not a great deal of understanding of what it means. We, we've come to assume that it means this Passover, which it was, a passage. But one of the real explanations of the Hebrew word is that it's an exemption. Hmm. It's an, you understand what an exemption is? Mm -hmm. Suppose you have to pay taxes and all of a sudden the government comes along and says, we're going to give you an exemption. Mm -hmm. That means that you're not subject to that. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing that the Passover was, was an exemption. Because God brought that debt. And yet... His people were exempt from that death. Christians today, I, I'm going to ask you to be honest with yourself and examine yourself. Does, does death hold any fear in your life? Because I meet Christians all the time, and in fact, in practice, in reality, they're afraid of death. That's because they don't understand. Mm. You see, do you know that it says that it's appointed unto man to die once and then the judgment? Do you know that it says that? Yes. To all my Hindu friends out there, no, you're not coming back as a frog, you're not coming back as a better person. <laughs> it's appointed unto man to die once. And then the judgment. Right? Does the Word of God say, does Paul say, in order to imitate him as we imitate Christ, does it not say that I have died and my life is hidden in Christ Jesus? Hallelujah. Okay, so I've died. Have you died? Have you died to yourself and come to life in Jesus? Yes. Have you? Yes or no? Yes. It's appointed on the man that will die once. Jesus Christ said, He who believes in me shall never die. You know why? Because you already did it. You got it over with. You took care of it. Amen. I died. It wasn't so bad. <laughs> it wasn't so bad. So I don't have... Death where is I victory? Death where is I sting? It's been conquered. Yes. We have passed out of death. The Passover. This is what we remember when we remember the Passover. It's not about Easter bunnies, chicks, little rolling eggs. Uh, it is about life in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Because we have been had death passed over us. Hallelujah. It's a Passover. It is not a single event. The Passover is not the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Passover is not the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The Passover is the crucifixion and death of Jesus Christ. It is a passage. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. Passover is a remembrance, a memorial, and a celebration of the event started that night. Now listen to these words. This is the Word of God. Now this day, talking about Passover, right, will be a memorial to you and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you are to celebrate it as an eternal ordinance. Eternal. Eternal. Forever. Exodus 12, 14. Listen to this. You shall also observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is part of the Passover, right? For on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a permanent ordinance. It is a night to be observed for the Lord for having brought them out of the land of Egypt. This night is for the Lord to be observed by all the sons of Israel 
throughout their generations. That is an eternal command. Eternal. So now, Christians have stopped celebrating Passover. Is that not true? We have changed it. We celebrate Easter. Psalm 119, verse 165. Why? Well, why? Do you understand? Have you ever heard the term replacement theology? Yeah. Replacement theology is a teaching that says that Jesus, that God Almighty turned His back on the Jews and replaced them with the Christian church. Oh, were it possible, I would love to see somebody stand before the Apostle Paul and say those words to him. He'd box your nose. Well, maybe he wouldn't. But he would certainly want to. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, irrepentable. Take your translation. God doesn't go back on His Word. Even when we're faithless, He's faithful. God has not turned His back on the Jews. Go read Romans 9, Romans 10, Romans 11. Go back and see. You see, God hasn't replaced the Jews. Not all Jews are Jews. That's what the Word of God says. You know? Not all Christians are Christians. God has not forgotten His people. He has not replaced us. Now, one of the reasons that this replacement <laughs> theology got so strong was because in the year 70 AD, Jerusalem was wiped out by the Romans. Early in the 2nd century, there was a false messiah in Israel, Simon bar Kokhba, I think his name was. And because of his rebellion against Rome, Rome came in and literally destroyed and kicked all of the Jews out of Israel. So now there's no more Jerusalem, now there's no more Israel. And the church, as it got established, was strong in Alexandria, Antioch, and in Rome. But Rome seemed to want to take power. If you know the history of Christianity, you know that particularly from the year around 325 when Constantine was emperor. Now, I hope this is not too dry or boring for you, but it's important. All right? mm -hmm. When he was emperor, Christianity became basically the official em uh, religion of the empire. Yes. You know why? And people, mo most theologians and most mainline denominations look at that and say, well, hooray, this is when Christianity became successful. I have to get that taste out of my mouth. It became successful. Constantine wasn't even saved. But he wanted peace in his empire. And there were so many, you know, there were so many religions. So what he did is he made one religion. But he wasn't about to say to the pagans, well, you can't worship your pagan gods anymore because they would have rebelled. Mm. So what he did is he inspired the church to bring all of those pagan traditions, all of those pagan gods, all of those pagan things into Christianity and make them part of Christianity. And all of a sudden, Christianity was dressed in, in foreign garments. Mm -hmm. We still are. It hasn't gone away. Now you say, okay, what do you mean he brought foreign gods in? If, you have, if you're not a Catholic or had been a Catholic, you may not understand this. Half of the saints that the Catholic Church has worshipped, and yes, they worship them, for the past 1,700 years were, were pagan gods who were just brought in and kind of baptized by the Catholic Church. That's a fact. Don't take my word for it. You know, it says study to show yourself approved. You've got to get into the Word, but you can, it doesn't hurt you to get in and learn a little history. And if you don't think that's true, go back and look at the Second Vatican Council of the Roman Church in the year 1965, when they kicked half of the saints out of the church. Because they were confronted with the truth, and they couldn't resist the truth anymore. My mommy would not let me drive a car, even though I was a grown person at 18, 19, and 20, unless I had a St. Christopher medal hanging from the dashboard. Wasn't she surprised when they kicked him out and said he never existed? We have brought so much compromise into the church of Jesus Christ. Mm. We need to return Amen. to that place where we are free to worship. Yes. Unburdened by the traditions 
that weigh us down mm. and keep us from Him. Yes. I just want to read you to... How many of you here know that the promise to Abraham, I'll bless those who bless you, still counts? Yeah. How many of you know that when Jesus returns, and trust me on this, test it in the Word of God, He is going to return. Yes. I don't believe it's far off. He's going to, he's going to return. He's coming back. He's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. He's coming back for a body without compromise. He's coming back. Where is he coming back? Who wants to say London? Who wants to say New York City or Washington, D.C.? Is he coming back to Moscow? Where is he coming back? Jerusalem. Oh. I will never forget you, my people. Can a mother forget her nursing? God will not forget it, the people that he calls. You want to know something? So the question is now, where do we stand with Jews? In those years of Constantine, I want to read, first of all, there was a guy named Bishop Melito. I know. Oh, this ought to be a college course where you can sleep in the back of the room. All right. When the church came, this is his words, written in the year around 180. When the church came on the scene and the gospel was set forth, the type, the Old Testament, lost its value by surrendering its significance to the truth. So this man said that when the church came on the scene, the Old Testament has no value. It gave way to the truth, the New Testament. He said on the Jerusalem here below once had value, but now it is without value because of the Jerusalem from above. That, my friends, is a lie from the pits of hell. The New Testament, how many writers, including, or speakers, including Jesus, said, like Paul, in one way or another, whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. Mm. That, that all Scripture, mm. what Scripture did they have when Paul wrote that? He said all Scripture. They had from Genesis to Malachi, I want to tell you. He said all Scripture is God-breathed, is the very breath of God that brings life. Right. But here is the, now, in the church, in the Christian church, you begin to see, they're saying it has no value. It's not even true. If you believe that, that's between you and God. But be honest enough with yourself that you go home tonight and rip Genesis out of your Bible. Rip Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Exodus. Rip it out of your Bible. All those Psalms you love so well. All those verses that we quote over and over when they say, you know, no weapon formed against me shall... Rip it out! It's either true or it's not true, and I'm here tonight to tell you that it is true. Amen. I'm not a fan of religion. People say to me all the time, what religion are you? Oh, I just don't like that question. Because they don't understand that religion is pure and undefiled religion. Is the widows and orphans taking care of and keeping oneself unstained from the world. That's religion in the eyes of God our Father. But to use that word religion that is, as it is commonly used, I'm going to stand here tonight before you and say there's only one right religion. It is Judaism. Not practiced the way most Jews do. Practiced the way Jesus did practiced the way Paul did <coughs> after the death the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the ascension of Jesus Christ, after the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God fell in mighty power on His people Amen. after that day He was still a Jew and not ashamed of it yeah. <coughs> but He practiced it different than all the other people were doing they have the right religion, they're doing it wrong we have been blessed Many years ago, when I was a pastor in New York, and I had a ministry in New York, I, you may not know this, but at the time, Brooklyn is one of the parts of New York City. It was the largest single Jewish community in the world. <coughs> Larger than, I mean, more Jews than in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv. Brooklyn, New York was the largest Jewish community on the face of the earth. We had a very large ministry to Jewish people, and I have seen many, many Jewish people come to understand the truth of the fact that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah of Israel. You know why? Because I never tried to convert them. I tried to get them to seek their God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when they sought the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, guess who they ran into? 
the son of the most high God. Amen. But I didn't try and convert them and say, you are, you are bummy people, you're wrong. I just tried to say to them, seek the God that spoke to you through your scriptures. And when they did, God took care of them. We need to understand this. That in spite of what these people say, in spite of what Constantine said, and I want you to hear what the emperor, the emperor who made Christianity legal and official, I want you to hear what he said. All I've got to do is just turn this page. <coughs> At the Council of Nicaea in the year 325, that's when he was emperor, he called, he wasn't saved, but he called this council of the Christian church. And then at the end of it, he wrote a letter to all of the bishops that attended. And here, I just want to read you two quotes from what he said. We ought not, therefore, to have anything in common with the Jews, for the Savior has shown us another way. We desire, dearest brethren, to separate ourselves from the detestable company of the Jews. Those are words I would expect to hear from Adolf Hitler. They came from a council of the church. Dare they say them to Peter, or Paul, or John, or James. Dare they say them. Dare they say them to Jesus Christ, who said salvation comes from the Jews. He said it. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Part of the problem is, I grew up, I told you, I grew up a Catholic. I can remember as a young kid, me, we lived in, a, in a, an apartment block for a little while. My dad was, well, I said, I'm not going to go that side. But I had a, a Jewish friend about my age. And I can remember going to him and telling him how, how he had to change because he was, a, he was a Christ killer. Now, if that sounds strange to you, I promise you, I may be older than you think, but I promise you that when I spoke those words to him, probably somewhere in the late 1940s. Get your calculator. That's what I believed. And I believed it because that's what I'd heard. That's what I'd been taught. So we came to hate the Jews because they were the Christ killers. So I want to ask you a question tonight. Who killed Jesus Christ? Come on, I said this is a dialogue. Shout out your answer. Who killed Jesus Christ? We did. We all did. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing at the trial of Jesus when the Jews were screaming. But rather that a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. So the Jews cried out and said, His blood shall be on us and our children. They were both wrong. See, Pilate, you can't wash your hands. <laughs> You can't say, you, you can't say, I don't have a position. There is no fence to sit on. There is no gray area. Jesus Christ said, you are either for me or against, or against me. me. There is no middle ground. Pilate was guilty of the death of Jesus Christ. The Jews who called out, crucify him, crucify him. Those same people of God who a few days earlier had been crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, are now crying out to the same God, saying, crucify him. Yes, they were guilty. I am responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. Because were I the only sinner that ever lived, he still would have gone to that cross for me. Amen. It was my sin that nailed him to that cross. Mm. I hear debates today that say, Oh, no, the nails didn't go through the hand. The nails went through the wrist. The nails didn't go through the hands. The nails went through the wrists. Well, the, the nails, if they went through his palms, they wouldn't have held him up. The nails never held him to that cross. It was his love for me that held him to that cross. Hallelujah. Because he could have come down from that cross any time that he wanted. Hallelujah. My sin nailed him to that cross. And his love held him on that cross. Nothing else. Your sin killed Jesus Christ. But hallelujah, thanks be to God for his love that he made an exemption. 
And the angel of death, when we were covered in his blood, washed clean by his blood of the Lamb, that angel of death passed over us. It's a Passover celebration, I want to tell you. I like this. Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. And then, think of this. He said, I find no guilt in this man. And then he pronounced sentence that the man be granted. So basically, Pilate said, I wash my hands. I don't want any part of this. I don't find any guilt in him. Crucify him. You know what I said before? It's appointed unto man to die once and then the judgment. Jesus Christ is being judged here. He's not being judged for his sin. He's being judged for my sin. He paid the price for my sin. He had no sin to pay a price for. But he who knew no sin became sin for my sake, for your sake, for our sake. We need to understand this and celebrate it because it is our passage. It is our Passover. From bondage to freedom, from darkness to light, from death to life. The religious leaders of the people of God wanted Jesus dead and gone. So they motivated the multitudes who had been crying Hosanna. And they motivated those people to cry out crucify him. I'm going to say this in love. Psalm 119, verse 165. Beware of these religious leaders who are serving themselves, building their own little kingdoms instead of building the kingdom of God. Trust me, 2,000 years later, they're still out there. So what did they do? The Jews wanted Jesus dead, so they did what happens, you see it in the movies all the time. They put out a contract on him. They hired the Italians to do a hit. <laughs> Is that not true? So you see, the people of God and the world combined to kill Jesus Christ. It took both. Because we're all responsible for the death of Jesus without exception. It was the world and the people of God came together to do it. When all is said and done, like I said, I killed Jesus Christ. I said, you've got to have a lamb. You've got to have an unblemished lamb. Jesus Christ, His public ministry, don't you know, it, see, it, it, it really begins as He arises from the waters of baptism at John the Baptist in the Jordan mm. River. But when John the Baptist saw Him, what did He say? Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Have any of you ever heard that old hymn? I love this hymn. Yeah. On a hill far away. Shall I sing it? Mm. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame and I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. He died for us, for a world of sinners. So has the Lord turned against the Jews? No. That's what grace is all about. And it says that the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also. The root is holy. You see, we've been grafted into that line. That's what it says. He didn't start something new over there. He grafted us into what he had already started. Because he, with the work he began, he is continuing and he's able to complete. All right? Like I said, they have the right religion, they're doing it wrong. We need to do it right. We have the right quote unquote religion, and more often than not, we're still doing it wrong. Now, I said I, I don't really want to get on. This is about Passover, not Easter. But I can't talk about Passover and not talk about Easter. Because you see, the church has put Passover aside in order to celebrate Easter. Is that true or not true? Yes. I mean, I'm, listen, I want to deal with the truth here. Mm. Romans 14, if you, if, you, if you don't know Romans 14, go, go read it a little bit. It's not about a day. Hmm. It's about a heart. Yeah. And, and it says in Galatians, because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our heart, crying, Abba, Father. That's, that's where you are. You're supposed to be able to cry out, Abba, Father. Hallelujah. Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, an heir through God. However, at that time when you did not know God, you were slaves to those by which nature are no gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it 
that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again. You observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I've labored over you in vain. That is New Testament. It is after the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus Christ. It is after the day of Pentecost when mighty fire of the Spirit of God fell on the church. It is after that, and Paul is still saying it to them. You're returning to those things that are not of God. You're compromising. How is that? Have I labored in you over in vain? Mm. That's not judgmental. People say to me all the time, you hang on that, they're judgmental. You want to know something? I am judgmental because of the love that God has put into my heart. Because it says, Paul wrote, you said, when I wrote to you, not to associate with immoral people, he said, I didn't mean the people out there, out in the world. The church sits around and we point fingers at the world constantly. <laughs> we consume all of our time talking about those bad people out there. God said, I'll take care of them. Mm. You take care of what's going on in the church. Mm. We need to start cleaning out the church. Awesome. You need to understand, we got false prophets running around all over the church. You ever read the book of Revelation? You ever read those letters to the churches in Revelation? Do you ever read that God said, I have this against you? That you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. When are we going to wake up? Somebody came to talk. It's not just a day. Whether you're talking about Passover today or Easter, it's not just a day. It is a heart attitude every morning your eyes open and you choose to say, this is the day that the Lord is here. I will rejoice and be glad. <laughs> then you will celebrate the Sabbath. You will celebrate the Passover. You will celebrate the great things of God each and every day. Most of this is a problem. I said this before. Listen to me. I say this in law. Most Christians don't walk with Jesus Christ. They visit Him once a week. They go to the church building to visit the Lord God. He wants us to walk hand in hand. Isn't that what it said in the prophet Micah? He wants to walk hand in hand with us. I said, you know, most of us, listen to what I'm saying, because I say this in love. Most Christians have an ineffective prayer life. It's not because of God. He's faithful. We're not learning how to pray. It says we have, this is a confidence we have. We know that we pray anything in His will, according to His will. He hears us. He hears us. Bada bing, bada boom. It doesn't say bada bing, bada boom. He hears it. He does it. We're praying too many things outside of His will. And we're praying. And, and in James, it talks about, you know, He uses an example of effective prayer, powerful prayer. He talks about the Elijah, right? So the effective prayer of a righteous man. The other question he talks, look at Elijah. But Elijah, you know what Elijah said? Go look at it. First Kings chapter 18. He said, I stand in the presence of God. I stand in the presence of God. He didn't visit him once in a while. He stood in the presence of God. I, when, when John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, was in the temple, giving service as the priest, and the angel Gabriel sh showed up, and the angel Gabriel said, you know, this is what's going to happen with your son. And Zechariah said, well, how am I going to believe that? And Gabriel said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. Come on. You want to have an effective prayer life? Don't just visit God. Stand in His presence. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Pray according to His will. And if you stand in His presence, I promise you'll know what His will is. Mm. That's not what you're going to talk about. Okay. Ah, Easter. Easter. I'm going to read you some... Uh, it's not about a day. Listen to what I'm here to say. I'm not going to talk about this a lot. But before I do, I just want to, I want to quote a verse to you. Psalm 119, <laughs> verse 165. Those who love thy law shall have great peace, and nothing shall offend them. Easter is not about a day, it's about a goddess. I want to read you a couple of verses from the prophet Jeremiah, which, by the way, is the Old Testament, and it is the everlasting Word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God spoke through Jeremiah and said, Do you not see what they are doing in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem? That's the people of God. This is Jeremiah 7, verses 17 and 18. 
The children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead the dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods in order to spite me. We are supposed to be serving and pleasing God. And here he says, my people are doing these things to spite me. As for the message, this is chapter 44 in Jeremiah. As for the message that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, this is the people now speaking to Jeremiah. To that message, we are not going to listen to you. But rather, we will certainly carry out every word that has proceeded from our mouths by burning sacrifices to the Queen of Heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, just as we ourselves, our forefathers, our kings, our princes did in the cities of Judea, it's their tradition, and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of food, and we were well off and saw no misfortune. Because you know, that's what they thought it's all about. How much ease you have in the world. So they are doing this, and God spoke to them through the prophet and said, you stop burning, you are doing this despite me, that you burn this incense to the Queen of Heaven. Do you all hear this? You ever hear these verses before? Do you know who the Queen of Heaven is? Go study. Go learn. Don't take my word for this. Go into a library. Go on the internet. Find out the truth. Her name was Ishtar. It was pronounced Easter. Astarte. She was the goddess of fertility and sex. The, the wife of the god, the false god, the idol Baal. Her name was Easter. That's the truth. I don't have, I will not stand here and apologize for the truth. The Christian church, I hear somebody praying, Oh God, I hope you use the name of Easter to draw people to you. What? May God smite me the day that I see him having to bow down and use the name of idols, of false gods to draw people to him. He said, when Jesus is lifted up, he will draw a man. Hallelujah. We need to repent of Easter. Psalm 119, verse 165. Take it up with God. Hallelujah. It's all about fertility. That's what the rabbits are. That's what the Easter eggs are. These were all pagan symbols that were drawn into the body of Christ so we would have compromise with the world and we wouldn't have to fight with them all the time. God set us free from the world. He did the impossible. He made a passage where there was no passage so that we could make the passage. From bondage into freedom. From darkness into light. From death into life. He made that possible. He parted it to get us out of the world. Us. Don't go back. That's why we are to celebrate the Passover. Not just once a year, but constantly throughout our generations for all time, day by day, as long as it's still called today, that we will remember what God did to separate us from the world that we might worship Him. Hallelujah. We have forgotten that. We think it's about just making things fun for us, fun for our kids. Chocolate buddies, chocolate this and chocolate that. It is about the power, the mighty power of God Hallelujah. to separate His people from Amen. the world Amen. and the things of the world. Hallelujah. Yes. And we're called to remember it. Now I'm going to get ahead of myself because I said I was only going to do this for about an hour. Passover. We're going to do this next week and then we're going to have a Passover celebration. Amen. We are going to do the Passover service next week. But listen to me. Christ desired to celebrate that last Passover of His life with His disciples. It was a Passover dinner. They did Passover. Is that not true? On that night, he took bread and he broke it. You all know this. He took a cup of wine, drank it and passed it. His body, the body of the unblemished lamb. He took and said, this is the cup of my blood. The blood that washed us clean, that protected us from the angel of death. The Apostle Paul in Corinthians said, we are to celebrate that until he comes. Mm. Proclaiming his death until he comes. That's why Paul, he knew that. And that's why he said, I have determined to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. 
Because that communion that we are supposed to do, the early church, it says they went house to house day by day celebrating the Passover. Celebrating their passage into life, into light, into freedom. Day by day. We say, oh no, that's them Jews what do that. Well then, hallelujah, I'm a Jew. Because I am going to celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I am going to celebrate the freedom day by day. As long as I draw breath on this planet. We are to be a Passover people. I know that it stands in the face of so much tradition to stand here tonight and say it's not about Easter. I know I am not a stupid person. I may not be the brightest, but that's all right, because he doesn't need the brightest. You see, he still chooses the foolish, the shame, the weak, Hallelujah. the wonder. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He can still use my weakness to perfect his power. Hallelujah. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, I, I know this. <coughs> Though everybody hate me, because I come out and stand against the traditions that the church has wrapped itself in, so that people in the world no, no longer even see Jesus Christ because we've bundled him so, up so much in our... I don't care. Because I'll stand here tonight and then by saying if God is for me, who can be against me? I hear the voice of God ring through the Apostle, Prop, the, the Apostle Paul when he says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman. My life is about pleasing God, not about pleasing people, lest I would never be able to please God. We need to return. We need to return, not to Egypt. We need to return to the other side of the river, where day by day, we sing, we dance, we have a jubilee, and celebrate the life that Christ, that unblemished Lamb, that Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, that Passover Lamb, we need to celebrate that day by day, every day of our life, until we stand in the heavens before the throne of God, and say, Behold the Lamb. Next week, we'll get into this seriously. Amen. I just pray, I, I pray, Lord, just, just help us, Lord God, to understand what it means to be a people who worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Lord, a people who have been saved by the promised Messiah of Israel. Lord God, not that we go into bondage under the law, but we find the freedom in your word, Lord. Every word that you've spoken that brings us that breath of life and sets us free. Help us, Lord, to be what you desire us to be and not what we have chosen to make ourselves. And Father, I ask you this in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and I trust in the power of your Spirit to make it real in our lives. Amen. On a hill, far away, stood an old holy cross, a symbol of suffering and shame. And I love 